right, so good morning. I want to start off by telling you a little bit about where I work. So I work at a company called Synapse. We're an industrial IoT company based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And we have a full-time staff of about 20 software engineers. What we do at Synapse is we're working to try to improve North American manufacturing's competitiveness in the marketplace. And the way we do that is by trying to make them more sustainable. So you can kind of think of Synapse as being like the Philips Hue meets the Google Nest, but for big manufacturing facilities. So when we're talking about building these kinds of solutions out at Synapse, we've got a really deep stack. At Synapse, we're making the hardware ourselves. We're designing and making the hardware. We're writing the embedded code for that hardware. We're connecting it up to local application servers, which pump data into a massive cloud application. And at the very tip of that is this Angular-based user interface. So when I was preparing this talk, I went to my director of software engineering, and I said, hey, this little bit up here, this Angular bit, Amongst this whole stack, what does this part of our application stack mean to you? And he said to me that Angular to him means quality and productivity. So that kind of surprised me. What was it about Angular that impressed on my director of software engineering this idea that Angular was somehow increasing our productivity and quality in our software applications? So I took a step back and I sort of tried to puzzle this out. What was it? And I think it has a lot to do with the ecosystem in Angular and the way that that ecosystem has transformed Synapse's approach to quality, productivity, and code velocity. So what I want to do today is kind of do a brisk walkthrough of some of these elements of the Angular ecosystem. And I want to give you a case study, Synapse's real experience of deploying these technologies in our application to try and give you an idea of maybe some improvements you can make in your own organization. So the first bit of this ecosystem puzzle that I want to unravel is Angular Material. Angular Material is a library developed by the Angular team. So this is written by Google engineers. It's free, and it's an open source project that you can use inside of your company. And the first part of Angular Material that's transformed Synapse is that it provides us a core set of components that we can use to build our applications. You've heard a little bit about components this morning, but what does this mean in the context of Angular Material? Well, if you've ever used an application, you've maybe interacted with a dropdown or dragged a slider opened up a menu, seen a modal dialog, seen a little toast notification. All of these base sets of components that are common across applications tend to have a counterpart inside of Angular Material that your developers can use for free. At Synapse, I went through our entire code base, and I looked at all the components that our developers have authored over the past three years in Angular. And over 600 components at Synapse use an Angular Material component. That means that there was over 600 times when one of our developers started to write a component, and they didn't have to go the extra distance to build some base set of functionality. They were able to leverage a component that exists inside of Angular Material to get an immediate productivity win. But my favorite part of Angular Material is that it ends debates about design. So there's this term software engineers use that may, you may have heard yourselves. It's called bike shedding. And it comes from this British naval historian. His name is Northcote Parkinson. And Mr. Northcote Parkinson was, in the, was on the design committee for a power station. It was a nuclear power plant. And he found that the committee spent so much time talking about the materials used to build the bike shed outside of the nuclear power plant that they didn't spend enough time devoted to the design of the nuclear power plant itself. And the reason this happens is that Members of an organization, when asked to give feedback about something, give a disproportionate amount of weight to the things of it that they understand. They give weight to trivial issues. And as a UI engineer for most of my career, I've seen this come up time and time again, where we've gone through this lengthy design process. We've gotten it reviewed and approved. We've actually built the feature. And when it came time to demo it to our stakeholders, we spent the majority of that demo talking about the color of some kind of element or the way that something looks and not at all about how it behaves or how it solves our customers' problems. And I don't mean to call you out, but you're the ones that tend to do this bike shedding. <laughs> the managers are the ones that tend to say, oh, I don't like the way that looks, because it's easy to give commentary on. It's a lot harder to actually talk about, did you build this right? Did you get the performance right? Angular Material is a big productivity boost for us, because Angular Material is built on top of this design specification. You can find it at material.io, and it gives you detailed guidance on how to build great-looking and great-working 
user interfaces for the web. And this has become a productivity enabler for us because when someone says, are you sure that's the right color? We can point to a reference document and say, yes, by the spec we've all agreed on to build our applications, this is the right color. And we're killing that bike shedding up front and we're having more meaningful conversations about the features and softwares that we're delivering. Another aspect of Angular Material that I absolutely love, and this is actually a really new one, this is one of the newer ones that I'm gonna talk about today, is this idea of test harnesses. So in a little bit, Joe's gonna talk about automated testing and different strategies to do that. And as a company, we spend a lot of time writing automated tests. And one of our hardest tests to write are ones that are interacting with UI elements directly. Like I have spent so much time writing a unit test that just opened up a select menu and picked an option. It's actually very hard to do from a software engineering perspective. But now, as of recently, Angular Material comes with this thing called a test harness. And what that lets your developers do is they don't have to spend time writing that code that interacts with these components. Instead, Angular Material is shipping with code now that your developers can use both in their unit tests and in their end-to-end -end tests to automate the control and functionality over Angular Material components. Test harnesses for Synapse are making writing tests easier. And I'm gonna say now that the only way to get developers to write tests is to make it easy for developers to write tests. So that's Angular Material. But there's actually a second half of Angular Material that we use pretty heavily, and that's the Angular CDK. CDK stands for Component Development Kit, and at its core, it's a base set of functionality for authoring your own components. Because inevitably, your engineers are gonna have to write components that don't exist in a component library like Angular Material. What the CDK gives you is a shared set of base functionality to author really high quality components. So simple strategies like accessibility or handling internationalization correctly, there are pieces of those puzzles inside of the CDK that your developers can leverage to build really great components. Speaking of accessibility, however, CDK excels here. I firmly believe that users should be able to use your apps regardless of whatever impairment they may struggle with. And it can be really hard to get this right. You can spend a lot of time upfront investing and in trying to get accessibility right and still fail. But with the CDK, you are getting a lot of tools to write accessible components for free. And all those components inside of Angular Material, since they're built on top of the CDK, they're also really great at passing accessibility audits. And I mentioned accessibility audits because I have personally seen the business cost of not doing accessibility the right way. At Synapse, about two years ago, we started to engage with a large national retail chain that has stores all over the United States. I won't say who it is, but they had some concerns up front before they'd commit to purchasing our product. They wanted to understand, was our application secure? It was. But they also wanted to know, is our application accessible? And that was pretty unique. We had not actually seen that before, which gave us a bit of a panic. All of a sudden, our sales staff and our engineering managers were a little concerned. Have we done accessibility the right way? And even though it had never really been in our conversations or at the forefront of our engineering process, because we had been building on top of Angular Material from the beginning and on top of the CDK from the beginning, we passed that accessibility audit. That's how much value we got. If we had not passed that accessibility audit, we would have probably lost that major deal, and that had been really disadvantageous for Synapse, because this was a massive deal for us. Synapse also leverages the theming and brand support inside of the Angular CDK. So at Synapse, we don't just ship one software product, we actually ship a, different, a couple of different products, and they have to look and feel a certain way based on the application of the customer using it. So we have a feature that looks like this and a dark theme, and we might need to ship the exact same feature for another customer in a completely different look and feel. The Angular CDK and Angular Material give you a robust set of tools so that you can build apps that match the look and feel of your brand. It has theming built in so you can try and solve some of these big business problems. So that's the Angular CDK and Angular Material. For us, it's been about accelerating our ability to write components, making sure those components are really high quality, either because it's made it easier for us to write tests for those components or because we're getting accessible accessibility at a much lower cost. 
It's also giving us theming and brand support, meaning we're shipping apps that match the look and feel that our customers are expecting. The next part of the ecosystem that I want to talk about, though, is the Angular CLI. Aaron showed a little bit about it. I want to show or highlight a few other features that I think are really killer about this tool. The first is schematics. Schematics are a command you can invoke from the Angular CLI that scaffolds out code. Why is this important? You remember my story about the, about the bike shed where I blamed you for bike shedding all my designs all these past years? You are not even close to as bad of a bike shedder as developers are about the way code looks. Engineers spend so much time debating about the formatting of code, the layout of code, the names of file names, the names of folders, that it can actually become a bit of a hindrance when you're starting off new projects. What schematics allow you to do is it allows your organization to make decisions up front. How is code going to be laid out? What is the base template of any file going to look like? And you can encodify these inside of schematics. Then when developers are actually building features and products, they can invoke these schematics and get the code in the right format for free. This means engineers are going to spend less time debating about the format and file structure of their Angular applications. The Angular CLI also handles build configuration. I'm not going to get too deep into build configuration, but instead what I want to highlight is that build configuration is really expensive. Aaron showed you how quick and easy it is actually to build an Angular app using the CLI earlier. It was one command and it was built. That is really new for UI engineering in the web. This idea that we have a tool to build our apps for us that encapsulate all of the build configuration. I was speaking to him this morning actually about this slide, and he told me that at a previous job, before we had tools like the Angular CLI, he was spending about one person's full-time salary a year just maintaining the build pipeline for the projects inside of his company. This is crazy. I mean, that is a ton of money, a full-time software engineer salary. I've actually gotten to spend a good bit of time with bigger organizations helping them work out or deal with um, NGRX, companies like SpaceX or Google. And these companies struggle with this so much that they have full-time positions called build engineers that focus just on this problem. The Angular CLI, though, encapsulates the responsibility of ang building Angular projects for your developers. Your developers don't have to spend time maintaining build configuration. By using the CLI, they can build products fast and ship. They can focus on writing code, not the configuration that actually compiles it. But perhaps most controversial is that Angular CLI supports mono repositories. This is another technical term, so let me try and break this down for you. At your house, you probably have a collection of ingredients you use to cook. You have flour, sugar, vegetables, things like that. Developers, when we build apps, we also reach for a common set of ingredients. Most of the time, developers are reaching for ingredients they didn't build themselves. Angular is a good example for this, where they have to install that package and actually consume it. But as you scale your organization up, you are going to find that your developers want to build a core set of ingredients themselves for building applications. And what's interesting about developers' approach to this is they tend to think that, oh, because I had to go to the store, so to speak, to get this one ingredient, I need to do the same thing. So what they tend to do, the naive approach, is to build a pantry, a separate pantry, for every ingredient they build. And this is kind of crazy, because this is a lot of infrastructural cost to achieve modular code design. And that's what we're really talking about. How can we have your organization achieve modular code design, reuse code across your organization, without suffering from expensive infrastructure costs? That's what monorepos enable your teams to do. Monorepos is this philosophy that you're going to take all the code in your organization and you're going to put it in one repository. And your engineering staff is going to share responsibility for that one repository. And now if I have to share code between projects, it's much easier than before because I've put all the ingredients in the same pantry. I can reach from the same spot to pick something out that another team has built. Angular CLI has built-in support for managing a monorepo of Angular apps and libraries. Remember those schematics that I mentioned earlier? 
Angular CLI ships with schematics that scaffold out apps and libraries within the same repository. This gives your developers the ability to quickly build out a monorepo for all the Angular applications and libraries that they're going to author. There's also kind of a spicy upside to monorepos that we've seen inside of Synapse. And it's that monorepos are really great at getting people to pay attention to test results. So at Synapse, we're organized into different teams. And different teams tend to naturally gain ownership over projects, applications, or libraries. And it can be really easy for your developers to be like, ah, that's that team's fault. Like, they own that. So when that thing breaks, not my responsibility. It's the other team's responsibility. But in a mono repository, when you're trying to merge code into it or add new features, you're running all the tests across your entire organization. Suddenly, if something breaks, you can't just say, ah, eh, it's another team's fault. They'll fix it. You can no longer get your code in the repository. It forces your organization to share ownership of different codes and libraries. And breaking down walls of ownership is critical to scaling up your development team. So that's the Angular CLI. It gives you schematics, the ability to encodify your engineer's design style into templates that they can invoke through the CLI. It handles build configuration so that you're not paying for a full-time engineer to maintain it for you. And it has support for mono repositories, allowing you to scale up your organization by sharing modules of code across different projects and teams, and by helping to break down the barriers of ownership. The last tool in the ecosystem that I want to talk about that Synapse has seen a lot of success with is NGRX. I'm going to say the second bullet point for a minute. I'm going to keep that a mystery. But first, I want to highlight what NGRX can do in terms of managing complexity. So my friend Lucas, who spoke this morning, a few years ago, he shared this really great paper with me called Out of the Tar Pit. And in this white paper, they describe that complexity is the single major difficulty in the development of large-scale software. It then goes on to actually define what complexity means. And I really resonate with this definition. They say that the major contributions to complexity is primarily state, along with code volume, and complex control flow. These are big topics. Let me break it down. So imagine you're headed home, and you need to get a quick bite to eat, so you decide to stop through a drive through You pull up to the ordering system. You speak to the person over the intercom, and you place an order. What happens then? What happens behind the scenes inside of this fast food restaurant? Well. If you've been inside one of these or sort of paid attention to how workers work in that environment, the first thing that's going to happen is everyone in the store basically gets a notification that there's a new order that needs to be fulfilled. And the way that works is that different employees of the restaurant each have different stations inside of the restaurant. And they have a monitor above their station telling them what orders need to be fulfilled and what's missing for that order to get it to be complete. As they do their task to complete that order, those displays across the entire restaurant update in real time so that everyone is sharing a common understanding of what the state of the orders are. And that's what state is. It's information that changes over time. Applications deal with state all the time. Now imagine if that fast food restaurant didn't have a consistent approach to state. Imagine if every monitor said something a little different. What kind of chaos would go inside of that restaurant? I'm sure you could probably imagine a fast food restaurant that probably has this problem. And it's just chaos. We don't have a shared understanding. Apps can have the same problem. NGRX gives your developers an architectural solution to maintaining state in a consistent and global way. Extending this analogy, it also handles control flow. So what does control flow mean? Well, in order for the state to change, workers have to actually be doing something, right? You're going to have some workers may be putting patties on the grill. Someone's dunking fries in hot oil. Someone's actually taking completed food items, putting them in a bag, and giving it to the customer. With NGRX, you're given a model for handling control flow in an asynchronous way, much like a fast food restaurant. You can have one action invoked, you going to the drive-thru and actually placing an order, 
cause a number of different things to occur behind the scenes. This architectural pattern allows you to build really robust and high-scaled applications. And this might sound really great. I might have sold you, like, yeah, I want to build our Angular apps just like a fast food restaurant, but there's a big downside to this approach. I want to be honest with you up front about it. And that's code volume. So if you really want to push this analogy to its limits, you can kind of think of this as the square footage it took to build the restaurant. If you're going to use NGRX inside of an Angular app, you better build a really big restaurant because it's going to take a lot of space to actually be successful with this approach. Now, for certain teams and organizations, this is totally a reasonable trade-off. If you're really focused on performance, go for it. If you have a lot of engineers, you are probably going to already have to purchase that much space anyways. Go for it. But if you've got a small team or performance, pushing your Angular app to the extreme of performance, isn't that valuable to you? This is almost certainly way too much real estate for you to be purchasing. So that's complexity management. But what about this mysterious second one? I can only say this to you, the managers. I cannot say this to developers later this afternoon. NGRX is horribly boring. <laughs> it is the most boring thing that I can imagine when it comes to building Angular apps. I was having a conversation with one of our junior engineers just a couple of weeks ago. And I was sort of talking about, hey, you've been at Synapse now for about a year. What do you think? What are you enjoying? And he said, NGRX makes developing features boring. Because whether we're building this really real-time visualization of our IoT devices, or we've got like this simple CRUD page for managing users, it's all built the exact same way. One of the steps that your developers will do when they're building an NGRX app is like writing actions. And I went and searched our issue tracker for how many times we had an issue called writing actions. And I found 450 plus issues just for that title alone. Like every feature gets built the exact same way. And so there's not a lot of like excitement when you move on from Epic to Epic, but this is actually not a bad thing. A long time ago, I worked at a Dippin' Dots over the summer, and I'm excited to talk about Dippin' Dots for the first time in a talk. If you've not had Dippin' Dots, it's basically we took ice cream, we poured it in liquid nitrogen, and out came beads of ice cream. So imagine you're at your house, and you get out a tub of ice cream, and you go to scoop it. You know how hard it is to scoop that ice cream? Like, it's a lot of work to actually get a good scoop out. When it's a dot, oh boy, it's so easy to scoop that ice cream. It's the most boring job I've ever had because there is literally no effort to working out of Dippin' Dots. You just scoop the ice cream, it's super easy, it's a bunch of beads, and put it in a cup. And I did it for like four years as a teenager straight, four summers in a row. And it actually taught me a really interesting lesson, which is that repetition is the friend of mastery. Over time, I actually got better at scooping Dippin' Dots, which is a weird thing to say. I created less mess, there's less spillage across containers, I was getting a better looking product over and over again to the customer. And that's what NGRX has unlocked for Synapse. Because it's so dreadfully boring, every time they go and build a new feature using NGRX, they're getting better and better at it. We've got a really great team of UI engineers now because they are understanding how to build this after going through the repetition and building mastery for building the kind of products. The last thing I want to point out, and it's kind of a little bit of a brag, but that's OK, is that you get to build Angular apps like Google. So inside of Google, they use Angular. But over 3,000 of the apps inside of Google use NGRX. And I point this out because the reasons that they're doing it are for the same ones I've just mentioned to you. They're caring about performance. They're caring about building consistent applications. And it lets them share an understanding of how applications are built across their entire organization. So that's NGRX. It's a prescription for managing complexity inside of Angular apps. It's horribly boring for your engineers, but that's great because they're going to get really good at it after a while. And you're building Angular apps in the best way I know how to build an Angular app. So what did quality and productivity mean to my manager? It meant building into this massive ecosystem that changed the way we build UIs at Synapse. Whether it's Angular Material, which accelerated us by giving a core set of components that ended debates about designs inside of our meetings and give us better tools to write tests, or the CDK, which gave us a base set of functionality to write our own components, allowed us to achieve accessibility, winning business, and build good brand and theme support for our products. We achieved quality and productivity through the CLI by encoding our design language into our schematics by not having to pay someone to manage build configuration anymore, 
and to unlock the ability to write our applications using a mono repo. It's also allowed us to manage the complexity of our Angular apps by tapping an NGRX. It's allowed us to scale up our developer resources. And it's allowed us to architect like Google, which is kind of fun to say. So Angular is more than a technology choice for your organization. If you tap into and embrace parts of the ecosystem, you can really get a lot of productivity and code quality from that ecosystem. If some of these ideas seem interesting to your organization, you don't have to build these yourselves. Some of these, like mono repositories or NGRX, will require a lot of re-architecture. That's OK. I just recommend getting some outside help to achieve that re-architecture. I've also brought one of our software engineering managers with me. So Jeremy, if you don't mind raising your hand for a second, he is a manager at Synapse. Feel free to connect with him, talk with him, and ask him how these technology choices have given him benefits in managing his team. Also give him a business card because he wants those points. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I look forward to connecting with you throughout the day.